Thank you so much for joining us. We hope this ministry has touched you and we'd love to hear your story. So please contact us at stories at edgewaterchurch.com. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry financially, you can go on edgewaterchurch.com and choose the giving button that works best for you. Again, thank you and prepare your hearts for today's message. Last week was a fabulous week here. Um, our little friends, we had about 50 of them all week. Today, we've got 35 of them coming up on stage. And that is a record number for them coming to actually perform. We had a blast, and like Pastor Dan said, they had fun every day. They never shied away from their energy. It was fabulous to watch. They got to learn that God is the God of the universe, and amazing things can happen when you believe in him. So they're going to perform here for you guys today. So enjoy. A perfect invitation Let's join with all creation And be the light for all to see We're like stars Shining up through the night Shimmering in the sky Show the world that we love Jesus Stars Fun with us so bright Faith with hope and light Bring the glory We will shine like stars kicking off a brand new series. I'm really excited about this because, um, you know, here it is. It's summertime. Well, I mean, it's been 90 degrees for a few months now, but still, we've got the, the rain, it seems like, every day. The days are so long, and around here at Edgewater, summertime means we hit a series from the Old Testament. We always take some time to jump into the Old Testament, take a look around there. Uh, we've done series based on Moses and Jonah and Elijah and Elisha, even Habakkuk we threw in there one year. Um, but today we are starting a four-week series on a book from the Old Testament that contains an incredible story. I mean, this, this story has all the makings of a Hollywood blockbuster um, there's a powerful king and an orphan girl. There are assassination attempts. There's political intrigue. There's this horrendous tragedy that's narrowly averted. There's tension and drama and a huge musical number that I will perform in the original language. Well, not that last one. Don't worry. Um, but it is awesome. And so we are going to spend some time in the book of Esther. Um, now, there's still maybe some of you may be thinking, you know, man, why do we have to... 
Why do we have to go through this Old Testament stuff, you know? Because that's where God seems all angry, and, and there's stuff I don't understand, and all these names that I can't pronounce. Um, and, and maybe even the, the pages in your Bible in the Old Testament are all still, like, stuck together because you just never open up that part of the Bible very much. Now, I can understand it if you feel that way. Because um, first and foremost, the, the stories of Jesus are all in the New Testament. And so we like reading the stories about Jesus. Um, the New Testament's a lot easier to understand in some ways than the Old Testament. There's a lot more emphasis on grace and forgiveness and not so much the earth opening up and swallowing people. Okay, So, so we like the New Testament. But we got to be very careful because check out this verse as we get started. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture, let me hear you say, All Scripture. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So it starts out by saying all scripture. So if we want to know the fullness of God, we need to get to know the fullness of God's word. And, and so we want to be people who are rooted in Scripture. And if we only pick half of it, or maybe just kind of focus on the parts that we like or agree with, then we're missing out on all of what God wants for us. So we want to be able to look at all parts of the Bible. Now, God created us all in unique ways. We're, we're, we're all wired differently. God connects with us in unique ways. Some folks connect with God in some ways better, some with other um, we, we learn differently, again, because we're, we're put together as different types of people. So on our part here at Edgewater, as we prepare uh, the services and the messages and stuff like that, we try to mix it up from time to time, so we get a chance to connect with different people in different ways. Um, I'm not always the person who's up here preaching every week. By the way, didn't Will do a great job this week, man? Tell you what, let's give God glory. For that message, man, if you missed it, you got to get online on our website, edgewaterchurch.com, our Facebook page, YouTube channel. You got to check it out because, man, he brought it last week. That was awesome. Um, so, so because we all learn different ways and we're all different people, we try to also um, maybe give different types of sermons, okay? There, there are some sermons that we preach that will get you all fired up, and there are, there are some sermons that may get a little emotional, may make you cry. Occasionally, I might preach one that makes you fall asleep. I don't know. Um, but, but I'll tell you what, this series that we're going to enter into right now is going to be more uh, about teaching a little bit. It's going to be teaching-oriented. We are going to walk through the story of Esther. Now, we talked about diversity. Even the Bible itself is, is diverse. Um, there are all sorts of literary genres found in the Bible. There are historical narratives and epics, like the story of Esther that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, there are books of the law, books of poetry, books of prophecy, books of wisdom. There, there's apocalyptic literature. You have the Gospels, which are the stories of Jesus. You have uh, the epistles, those uh, instructional letters that make up the, the majority of the New Testament. So, all of that being said, this series is going to be a little different. Um, but part of that is because the book of Esther is very different. One of the unique characteristics of the book of Esther is that God is not mentioned in the entire book. Okay, But as we walk through the narrative over these next few weeks, you will find out that just because God is not mentioned, it doesn't mean that God's not present. You know, Isn't that the way God works in our lives sometimes? That he may not make his presence known through a, a burning bush or lightning from the sky or some type of miraculous occurrence. But when you look back at the journey that you've walked, you see God's fingerprints all over it. So let's get a little bit of background here into the book of Esther. First of all, who wrote it? Well, we don't know. Okay, sorry, sorry to start off on that positive note there. We, we, we just don't know. Um, some scholars say that it was written by maybe either Ezra or Nehemiah. Those are the two books previous to Esther. Um, uh, some people say that it might have been Mordecai, who is uh, Esther's older cousin that we're going to talk about in just a little bit. So, so no one knows for sure who wrote it. But one of the things that we do have a better idea about is, is when the story takes place. So, so we're going we're gonna to pull the lens back a little bit here to kind of get a, a bigger picture for a moment. And we're going we're gonna to have a little bit of a history lesson here, kind of anchor this all in world history. Um, and so if you look at, at the map, you see how um, you can't see it necessarily designated, but you see this big white area on this side. That's the Mediterranean Sea. And the coastline right next to that, that's where Israel's located. 
Okay, so Israel's right up there, and um, God put them in that strategic position for a purpose. Okay, because at that point, that that stretch of land was the crossroads of the world. So if you were traveling anywhere, um, going from Asia over to Africa or up into to Europe, you had to go through that little strip of land. And so uh, the good part about it was that if you were trading or traveling or whatever, you got a chance to maybe hear a little bit about God because you were going right through that area, through the promised land. Now, the downside of that location is that it put them right smack dab in the middle of the world powers at the time. Okay, so, so the Egyptians were down here in this section uh, of the top part of Africa, and you had the Babylonians that were all out through here through Asia. So um, now in 605 BC, to kind of give you the time frame that we're looking at, 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar led the Babylonians to victory over the Egyptians. All right, they came down through there. But of course, in order to get there, they had to kind of go through Israel to get there. Um, and so what happened is, is that uh, the king at the time, Jehoiakim, um, started sending tribute to Babylon, basically to say, hey, when you come through to crush Egypt, please don't step on us either. And so, so they sent money. They sent people as well. They sent a lot of the young nobility. Um, that's where, like, you, you may have heard of Daniel in the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were some of the ones that were sent over to Babylon during that time, a period of what's called the Babylonian captivity. So that was kind of the first wave of people that went over there. But the king eventually tried to revolt. He didn't like that setup very much. In 598 BC, Jerusalem was attacked and put under siege by King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians. And the city fell the next year. And, and so the Babylonians then took more people into captivity, including like the prophet Ezekiel. You may have heard that name from the Old Testament too. So he went over kind of in that second wave of, of folks. So things kind of stayed in turmoil in that area until finally Nebuchadnezzar just kind of had enough of the, the, the buzzing noise from, from Israel. And so he came back, he destroyed the walls of Jerusalem, he destroyed Solomon's temple, and all of that happened in about 587 B.C. So by that point, a lot of the Jews had been taken into captivity. Some of them had just fled the country because they were tired of the armies marching back and forth through there. And so it was, it, it was a difficult time. Um, so this finally continued until then the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians. Okay, the Persian king Cyrus defeated the Babylonians in 538 B.C. So as soon as Cyrus took over, he kind of wanted to build up some goodwill with the people in the area. And so he told the Jews that they could go back to Jerusalem and they could rebuild the city. They could rebuild the walls. They could rebuild the temple. And so he, he gave them permission to come back. Now, not all the people did come back. Um, some of them decided to stay behind, uh, maybe because you got to figure they'd been there for over 100 years at that point. And so uh, maybe they had established a new life. Maybe they felt that life was better in that area than it was in Israel. And so, um, so some of the people came back to Israel. Some of the folks stayed behind. So that's why you had a, a Jewish population there in Persia as well. So... Um, under the rule of King Cyrus and, and all the way down to King Xerxes, you may have heard that name, um, the Persian Empire then is what's represented here in the, in the yellow. So it's this huge empire going from India all the way over to Ethiopia, uh, just a, a huge place. Um, Esther's story takes place about 50 years after uh, King Cyrus gave the Jews permission to go back home. Okay. Now, the king that we're talking about in the story is King Xerxes. Um, he was in the process of trying to conquer like the world, basically. And, and he had pushed into Greece, up in that area in the upper left corner. He had taken um, 250,000 soldiers, quarter of a million soldiers, and had marched all the way up into Greece. Uh, but his, the, the, the march kind of lost steam a little bit, and they, they ended up kind of getting stopped. And so this story takes place when Xerxes had then come back home, and he's getting ready to rally the troops again for one more push to try to conquer Greece once and for all. Now, just a side note here. Man, one of the things I love about the Bible is that in so many places it is anchored in history. Okay, skeptics may come along and say, hey, all that Bible of yours, it's just a book of fairy tales. But you know what? There are so many places that you can trace things back to world events. 
and, and documented history. So while by and large the Bible is not intended to be a book of history, um, it's grounded in times and places and gives you that confidence and that foundation that you can stake your life on because you know it's not just something, a book of made up stories because there are places where it actually hangs its hooks in the world, in the history of the world. All right, so let's go ahead and jump in to see what the story holds for us again. It's an exciting story. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Esther and follow along. You can pull it up on your Bible app and follow along. Or, as always, the words are going to be up on the screen. So let's start with Esther, chapter 1, starting in verse 1, where it says, uh, These events happened in the days of King Xerxes, who reigned over 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. Again, that whole gold region that we had talked about there. Um, at the time, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Media, as well as the princes and nobles of the provinces. The celebration lasted 180 days, a tremendous display of the opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and splendor of his majesty. So again, it's King Xerxes that we're talking about in here. He, he's got a huge empire, um, and he's throwing an enormous party to celebrate himself. Okay? And that it's all about him. He's the richest, most powerful man in the world, and he wants everyone to know it. All right? He, he wanted to demonstrate his wealth on a practical way because they were getting ready to push back into Greece. And so he wanted to kind of inspire confidence in the nobles to say, hey, I've got the money and the power and the resources to carry this through to the end. And so, um, so he was kind of trying to, to get them ready for battle. But still, did, did you see that? that a six-month-long party. All right, now, now some of y'all might have been quite the partiers in your day. Um, you might have had a long weekend you don't remember somewhere along the line. But a six-month-long party? Come on now. I, I, I can't hardly last six hours on New Year's Eve. And, and they're, they got a six-month-long party. And then, check this out. Verse 5 says, When it was all over, the king gave a banquet for all the people, from the greatest to the least, who were in the fortress of Susa. It lasted for seven days and was held in the courtyard of the palace garden. So when the six-month-long party was over, what did King Xerxes do? He threw another party. All right? And so, so he threw a week-long party now here to follow that, like an after-party to the party. And that was a week-long. And, and there, was, there was only one rule at this after party. In Esther 1.8, it said, By edict of the king, no limits were placed on the drinking, for the king had instructed all his palace officials to serve each man as much as he wanted. So basically, the rules were that there were no rules. All right? So just, just this whole week long. They had already done six months of partying, and now they've got another week of partying. And, and so these folks, were, they were going at it hard. And, and even the queen threw her own party at the time. In verse 9, it says, At the same time, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. So, um, so the women had been kind of segregated out due to their gender. I think probably after having a whole bunch of people drunk for six months and a week, it was probably maybe for their safety to keep them out, uh, separate. Probably a good idea. Now, check this out. This is where it starts to get real here. Uh, verse 10 it says, On the seventh day of the feast, so again... Six months of being drunk, and then another week after this, it says, when King Xerxes was in high spirits because of the wine, that's a kind of probably a nice way to put it, um, it says, he told the seven eunuchs who attended him, those guys, um, so um, I'm not even going to try, um, so let's just, let's pause there for a second, all right? So, so King Xerxes now had been, probably been drunk for six months and then a week after that, and now evidently he has this good idea, all right? So nothing, nothing good could follow this. Um, whatever comes after this is probably ancient world equivalent of watch this, hold my beer, okay? <laughs> nothing good ever follows those words, all right? But the reality is true. Drunk people don't make good decisions. You know, nobody ever said, I got drunk and figured out my marriage, People don't say, I got high and ended up with the job of my dreams. We make bad decisions when we're impaired. And, and so they, they were all in a bad way. Six months and then an extra week on top of that. So let's see what brilliant plan he came up with here in verse 11. 
So he told the eunuchs to bring Queen Vashti to him with the royal crown on her head. He wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty, for she was a very beautiful woman. Now, some people say that the crown was the only thing that he wanted her to be wearing. And so um, Xerxes wasn't seeing her or treating her as his wife. He was treating her as an object, basically, something to just be paraded around in front of others. So let's see how well that went over with the queen. Um, In verses 12 and 13, it says, But when they conveyed the king's order to Queen Vashti, she said, Child, please. (laughs) No. Um, She refused to come. Um, This made the king furious. And he burned with anger. He immediately consulted with his wise advisors who knew all the Persian laws and customs, for he always asked their advice. So, of course, Queen Vashti wanted nothing to do with any of that. Um, but the king got mad. All right, now, one, because uh, he was drunk, but, but two, it was a slap in the face to him in front of all these people that he was trying to impress. Okay, it kind of questioned his authority. So he turned to his advisors who also had probably been drunk for six months and a week, and and he said, hey, fix my wife. All right, he he wanted to know what could be done within the rule of law to to address this affront to his royal personage, okay? And, And again, continuing at the theme of the morning so far, it is never a good idea to go to your drunk friends to talk about your marriage problems. Okay, just, just take that as a, I'll throw that one in for free today. Uh, good idea to stay away from doing that. And then, so let's see what they came up with, starting in verse 16. Um, so this guy answered the king and his nobles, Queen Vashti is wrong, not only the king, but also every noble and citizen throughout your empire. Women everywhere will begin to despise their husbands when they learn that Queen Vashti has refused to appear before the king. Before this day is out, the wives of all the king's nobles throughout Persia and Media will hear what the queen did and will start treating their husbands the same way. There will be no end to their contempt and anger. And I read that and it's, it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny that they take this one instance of a woman standing up for her dignity and, and they blow it up to the point that all of a sudden all women across the whole entire empire will now begin despising their husbands. And, and look at it. Before this day is out, they didn't have Facebook. All right, Queen Vashti wasn't tweeting, boy, my husband asked me to do this really stupid thing today. So there's no way it was going to happen that way. But what do we do? We blow things out of proportion. When, when there's something doesn't go the way we wanted it to, all of a sudden we maybe kind of try to put our feet down and go, no, that's it. Because if we do this, it's just going to be bad for everyone in the entire world. And, and so they, they blew it way out of proportion. So they continued on, starting in verse 19. It says, So if it please the king, we suggest that you issue a written decree, a law of the Persians and Medes that cannot be revoked. It should order that Queen Vashti be forever banished from the presence of King Xerxes, and that the king should choose another queen more worthy than she. When this decree is published throughout the king's vast empire, husbands everywhere, whatever their rank, will receive proper respect from their wives. Uh, Yeah, that'll work. And... um, And the king and his nobles thought this made good sense, so he followed this guy's counsel. Um, He sent letters to all parts of the empire, to each province in its own script and language, proclaiming that every man should be the ruler of his own home and should say whatever he pleases. So there you go, guys. Happy Father's Day. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that'll work well. Yeah, take take that home, write it on a 3x5 card, put it on your fridge. Don't make that your life verse, guys. Tell you what, you're going to be uh, sleeping on the couch for Father's Day. So, uh, yeah, yeah if, if they even let you back in the door, you're right. Um, it has never been a good idea to try to legislate respect. Okay? Um, rules can't force you to love. And I think that's one of the reasons that God sent Jesus. So, so that we don't have to be bound by a set of rules to try to earn God's approval. Because the reality is we already have God's approval. God created us. He loves us. He has a plan for our lives. He wants a relationship with us, not just that we adhere to a certain set of rules. Because that's not going to generate love. That's not going to generate a, a sense of respect. And certainly not in this case. You, you can't legislate that kind of thing. So let's start in on uh, chapter 2 then. It says, uh, but after Xerxes' anger had subsided, or maybe he sobered up a little bit, um, he began thinking about Vashti and what she had done and the decree he had made. When I read that, it, it kind of makes me feel like there's maybe a little tinge of regret in there. That, that maybe he was like, oh man, 
Is it, was that really what happened? Um, and he, he couldn't just bring her back. Because once, once the king of the Persians made a law, it could not be revoked even by the king himself. So he couldn't just take it back. We have to be careful about the decisions we make and the things that we say when we're angry. Because sometimes those things can't be taken back either. Once you say, I think we should get a divorce, you cannot unsay that. There are things that we say to our children in anger that years of counseling can't get rid of. We have to be really careful about uh, the decisions we make and the words that we say in the heat of the moment. So the advisors of Xerxes uh, came up with another idea. Okay, So they, they saw maybe that the king was a little down in the dumps. It had been at this point about two years that he had been without a queen. Um, and so they said, we're going to go throughout the whole kingdom and gather up all the beautiful women. Now, remember, the kingdom at that point stretched from India to Ethiopia, so a huge place. They said they're going to gather up all the beautiful young women, and they're going to bring them to the palace. And, and once they get them to the palace, they're supposed to receive 12 months of beauty treatments. <laughs> Guys, you think it takes your wife a long time to get ready. Um, 12 months of beauty treatments. Um, so, so they have 12 months to get ready to see the king. Now, Granted, probably that whole 12 months was not necessarily all spent on kind of the physical preparation. Uh, they were probably also being taught court etiquette. How do, you, how do you speak to the king? How do you act in his presence? How do you, how do you behave in the court? That type of thing. Um, but Josephus, the, the Greek historian, recorded that um, 400 women made the final cut to go to the palace. So, so out of that whole stretch, 400 women made the cut to go to the palace. And so... Verse 4, this, this cracks me up. Verse 4 says that this advice was very pleasing to the king. Well, duh. I mean, he's about to have 400 beautiful women vying for his attention. It's kind of like the ancient world version of The Bachelor. All right? Um, but instead of a rose, he's going to give the, the winner a crown. And not just a crown, but she's going to be crowned queen over that entire huge empire. Quite, quite the prize. So, all that we've talked about, all of this history, all of this background, all this information about King Xerxes, all of this kind of serves as setup and introduction for what's going to happen now, and we get introduced to the two main characters of the story. In verse 5 in chapter 2, we begin to learn about Mordecai and Esther. Now, Mordecai and Esther's families were part of the folks that were taken away in one of the Babylonian captivities. Um, it was more than, it more than likely happened before either of them were born, uh, that their families got taken over there. But when, even when King Cyrus gave them permission to come back home, their families decided to stay. Uh, we don't know why. We don't know a whole lot of background along those lines. We don't really necessarily know a whole lot of what happened there. But somewhere along the way, Esther's parents died. And so she was, was left as an orphan. Now, Mordecai was her older cousin, and so he, he adopted her and raised her as his own daughter. So Esther was one of those 400 women that made the cut, that got a chance to come to the palace. Um, once Esther arrived in the palace, she quickly won the favor of a, a guy named Hegai, who was the eunuch in charge of the king's harem. And uh, he made sure that she had the best of everything, uh, the best food, the best beauty treatments, the best location in the building, all of that. And so also at that point, Mordecai then was working at the palace. He had gotten a job serving somewhere in the palace. Um, and as, as he talked to Esther, they decided that it was best to keep their connection uh, from being known, that, that they didn't let anyone know that they were related. Um, and he also advised her to keep her nationality a secret so that they didn't know that she was Jewish coming into this situation. Um, when it was finally Esther's time, to come before the king, um, this was his reaction in verses 17 and 18. It says, And the king loved Esther more than any of the other young women. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. To celebrate the occasion, he gave a great banquet in Esther's honor for all his nobles and officials, declaring a public holiday for the provinces and giving generous gifts to everyone. So, big event coming up. What does Xerxes do? Throws another party. All right. So that's, that's like his go-to move, I guess, is this, is this party uh, thing. So he, he throws this party. Now, so, that, so, so some time had passed now until this happened. It was, a, it was a whole long process to get to here. And so at this point, uh, Mordecai had begun to rise through the ranks in the palace, and he had become an, an official, maybe middle management or so, somewhere in the palace. 
Um, he kept checking on Esther from a distance, again, still keeping their, their connection, their family connection, a secret. Um, after some time had passed in this role then, this happened in verses 22, or 21 through 23. Uh, it says, one day as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate to the king's eunuch, these guys uh, who were guards at the door of the king's private quarters, became angry at King Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. But Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. She then told the king about it and gave Mordecai credit for the report. When an investigation was made and Mordecai's story was found to be true, the two men were impaled on a sharpened pole. This was all recorded in the book of the history of King Xerxes' reign. But here's the thing. Not everyone was pleased or happy with Mordecai's rise to prominence in the palace. There was someone who wanted not only Mordecai dead, but he wanted to unleash his wrath on all of the Jews as well. Who was it? Dun, dun, dun. That's the cliffhanger for next week. You'll have to come back and find out. Gotcha. Or you could just go home and read it because it's right there in your Bible. So, (laughs) I mean, you could do that. (laughs) Um, um, so, So I encourage you. Do that. Now, normally I would say things like, hey, go home and, and read chapters one and two, and then the next week we'll start in chapter three. But you're going to start reading it, and you're just going to read the whole thing because it's, it's a great story. Like I said, it's only 10 chapters long, so, and it really flows quickly. So, so take some time to read it, get a chance. But do you see what I mean? It, it could be like a movie. It could be, it could be, and not just like the little veggie tales like some of us, us grew up on, but um, it, it just is a great story. That this incredible rise from being an orphan in a foreign land to being the queen of the largest empire in the world. Esther started from a really low place. The the people that God uses are not always the ones that you would picture as the typical hero. Esther's background was messy, like we talked about in our last series. It It was a messy background. But you know what? God had a plan for her. A plan for her to do something great and amazing that we're going to talk about over the next couple of weeks because I don't want to spoil it for you right now. But here's the thing. God's plan for Esther didn't unfold immediately. It it didn't just happen one day. Okay, There there was a time of preparation. It it took years of of moving things around, even if you trace it back as far as as her family being um, sent over to Babylon. I mean, you can see God working in the midst of all of this. It was a time of preparation. It gradually unfolded. It's a common theme throughout Scripture. God led the people of Israel through the desert for 40 years. Time of preparation. Jesus fasted in the desert for 40 days before he started his ministry. Again, a time of preparation. You may be looking at your life right now. Maybe you feel like there's nothing going on. You that you're just kind of spinning your wheels. You're not making any progress. But but you know what? Unless you are right at this moment living out the fullness of what God wants you to do, you are in a season of preparation. God is working in you and developing you and and strengthening you and helping you learn to trust in Him more and more to get you ready for what it is that He wants to do. Now, a lot of times, the way we look at these times of preparation is, is we feel like, well, because we're not there, well, I guess we're not doing anything. I guess we're useless. I guess we're not being used by God now because we're not doing that thing. But, but that couldn't be any further from the truth because in, in that time of waiting and preparation, we need to do more than just kind of sit back and kind of wallow in, in our setting. We need to be active. We, we need to be pursuing. We need to be growing. We need to be continuing to do what it is that God wants us to do to kind of continue to get ready because the if we're not getting ready, then we're not going to get to that point over there. There's, there's obviously something God wants to develop in us in this meantime. And so we need to be active. We need need to be seeking God's will and studying and praying and growing and serving and and getting ready because you want to be ready when when the time is right. You want to be ready when it's God's time for you. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this time together today. God, I thank you for Esther's story. And even though we, we don't necessarily see your name listed in the book, God, we can see you working through all of it. In the uh, clearing the way so that Esther could, could take the throne to be able to accomplish this amazing task that you have in store for her. 
the way that you prepare her, the way that you help her to find favor with those around her, even finding favor with the king himself. So God, we thank you for the way that you prepared her. And God, we thank you for the way that you are preparing us. Whatever it is that's going on. God, I pray that you don't let us get distracted or discouraged in this time. But we keep our eyes on you. Focusing on what it is that you want for us. And that we allow you to to develop Christ-like character in us. That we continue day by day to make the right choices. to, To study, to learn, to grow, to serve, to give. All of these different things that we need to do um, as as you are preparing us for what you have in store. So God, help us to, to be ready when your time is right. But maybe today uh, God's time for you is to make that initial commitment to him, to take that step, to say, hey God, you know, I've I've made a mess of my life as I, when I've tried to be the captain of my ship and uh but God, I want to I want to give you a try. I, w- I want to turn my life over to you. And maybe you're at that point today where where you've just come to the end of your rope, trying to do it yourself because, frankly, you've made kind of a mess of things. Maybe you you found yourself at a place where there's not a lot of hope. But I want you to know that there is hope. There's hope in a relationship with Jesus Christ that you can become the person that God created you to be that he can help to grow you and develop you in in ways that you maybe would have never thought possible. And it just starts with just saying yes to a relationship with Jesus. To say, God, I want to turn my life over to you. And so the way that we do it here at Edgewater is we just, I'm going to say a a prayer and I invite you to repeat the prayer after me out loud. So just repeat after me and pray, Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin please forgive me of all I've done wrong help me to live for you help me to be active in my time of preparation in Jesus name Amen